Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to very quickly give you a little wrap up of the Ladybird Tales My Once Upon a Time library. So, uh, my mom got me this as like an early Christmas present, and uh, basically, I've gone through, I've read all the books. I actually feel like I'm missing one, but I don't know where it is. But look, it looks as though I'm missing one, but maybe it's just expanded slightly. Or maybe I'll edit it in and figure out what it is that I'm missing. I don't see it anywhere, so. Who knows? What I've done is I've read all of these now and we're going to go through from my least favourite to my favourite and I'm going to say a few short words on each of them. So uh, these are all by Vera Southgate as well. They were all written during the 1960s and 1970s and they're like the classic versions that Lady Bird used to use back in the day. Obviously these are newer prints, newer editions of them. But um, yeah, I thought they were pretty cool. So my least favourite one, we have The Little Red Hen. Literally can't tell you anything about this one, I'm afraid. This one actually, even when I read it, five minutes after I finished reading it. I was like, what just happened? I don't remember. So, um, yeah, not the best, unfortunately. So next up, our second worst, we have the magic porridge pot. This one was a little better. It was about this magical porridge pot that kind of overflows and stuff. But again, didn't really, it didn't really stick with me. It also wasn't one. A lot of these are ones that I read when I was younger, you know, and they sort of have, I guess, um, you know, an emotional meaning to me in that context. But, uh, not all of them do, you know. So Chicken Lickin. This is another one that I hadn't read as I was as a kid. It's uh, one of many cyclical tales, which basically means that the story builds. So, for example, uh, you might have, I don't know, uh, a boy is going to market and then he gets followed by a girl and then a cat and then a dog and then a mouse and all this stuff. And then eventually you get like a payoff at the end. But they always annoy me because it means basically once you've established that pattern, you're just then flicking through the pages, just being like, when's this pattern going to end so that I can get to the resolution, you know? Whereas some of the others have more of a plot. Next up we have Rapunzel. Rapunzel was never really one of my favourites as a kid. I, it did make me laugh that, for a start, she couldn't tell the difference between the voice of the prince and the voice of the witch. Which kind of is pretty dumb of her. But also, how was her hair sustaining the weight of like a fully grown man climbing up it? And how did it not, A, just pull the hair out of her head, or B, yank her right out the window as well? I don't know. Then we have Rumpelstiltskin. So this is uh, the story. Basically, this man promises the, the king that his daughter can turn straw into gold. So the king takes the girl in and then is like, here is a room full of straw. I'm going to lock you in it. Turn it into gold, please. And then this little leprechaun dude comes along and, and turns it into gold for her. Um... But basically, he makes her promise a lot of things. And in the end, the only way she can get out of it is by guessing what his name is. And in the end, spoiler alert, she does. Not my favourite, to be honest. Then we have the big pancake. This is basically another one of those cyclical stories. A big pancake gets made. Everyone wants to eat it. And it's kind of rolling away from everybody. And everybody's chasing it. And uh, yeah, you'll have to read it to find out whether it gets caught or not. Okay, then we have the princess and the pea, and the weird thing with this one is this idea that a princess is supposed to be able to feel a pea through 40 different mattresses. You just, you wouldn't be able to. And also, it sends a bit of a weird message about how, like, weak and frail, I guess, princesses are meant to be. I never really enjoyed this one as a kid either, so perhaps that's why it's on the weaker end of the spectrum for me. Then we have the gingerbread man. This is another cyclical story, or cyclical story, however you pronounce it. And in this one, this is pretty much the same thing as happens as what happens in uh, the big pancake where everybody wants to eat the gingerbread man. We do have a little bit of magic at the start where this family, they want a child. And so they make a gingerbread man and then turn it into a living thing, which is just cruel because then everyone wants to eat it and it has sentience. But then people eat animals, so I don't know. Then we have Dick Whittington. The main thing that I took away from this is that there was actually a mayor of London called Dick Whittington, although he didn't really have a rags to riches story and didn't kind of go about it in the same way that Dick Whittington did. But um, I enjoyed reading this purely for that little factoid. Each of these, at the end of them, they have like a little summary of the history of the story and popular culture and where it came from and who wrote the first versions and that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Then we have Puss in Boots, uh, the thing in the uh, end of this actually was talking about its impact on Shrek. It's an okay story, I actually probably more preferred reading it because of the retellings I've seen of it and the stories I've seen that are inspired by it. Then we have Jack and the Beanstalk, this one's kind of interesting because it's a little bit, little bit darker now, we're getting towards some of the darker ones and you'll notice actually some of my ones towards the higher end of the scale are the ones that were darker. Uh, which is also truer, really, to um, the origins of fairy tales. But yeah, in this one, basically this witch 
deliberately makes sure that Jack gets his beans and goes up the beanstalk because he wants him to kill the giant. But then I suppose, I think in other versions it was called Jack, Jack the Giant Killer. Then we have Sleeping Beauty. I do quite like this story, but it does have this weird issue of consent when the prince just kisses this sleeping princess. Granted, it does wake her up and everything else, but it's also weird because basically he visits when exactly 100 years have passed and, and uh, all the trees and stuff that have overgrown and the bushes that have grown blocking off the castle, they allow him through and turn into roses as he goes. So I guess it's like maybe because the magic gave him consent. I don't know. No, that's still pretty weird. Then we have the, the Enormous Turnip. This made me think of a Roald Dahl story, in particular James and the Giant Peach. Basically, this is another cy cyclical story where this old dude plants a turnip. It comes out massive, so he pulls on it, then he gets his wife to help, and then the dog and the cat and a mouse, etc, etc. But that one was probably one of the best cyclical stories. Cyclical stories. Should have learned to say that before I started filming this video, really. Here we have The Ugly Duckling. This was never one that I enjoyed too much when I was a kid, but as an adult, I think I enjoyed, you know, the, the moral behind the story a lot more and the idea that you shouldn't judge other people based on their looks. And uh, also, yeah, this was just generally a pretty good retelling of it too. Then we have Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This actually is probably one of my fa favorite fairy tales. And so the only reason that it doesn't appear later on, although we are getting towards my top ones now, but the only reason it doesn't appear later on is the fact that this wasn't the best version of it, really. I mean, g g kind of, like, once once Goldilocks had been went in, she tried eating the gruel and stuff, then pretty much went to bed, then got woken up by the bears, and that was it. Like, nothing happened, really. And I just feel like there are other versions that are more fleshed out. Here we have the elves and the shoemaker. I vaguely remember reading this one as a kid, but uh, I really enjoyed it as an adult, actually. It's about this... Basically a shoemaker is down to his last piece of leather and he leaves it out overnight ready to make his last pair of shoes in the morning. And when he goes down, this beautiful pair of shoes have been made. So he sells it and he gets twice the price he normally would have got and that allows him to get twice as much leather and the cycle kind of continues. And then eventually him and his wife creep downstairs in the middle of the night to see what's happening and they discover that these elves have been working on them. So they decide to make the elves some clothes and then they leave out the clothes for the elves and the elves are like, yay, now we can be free and they never come back. Uh, and that's also where J.K. Rowling got some of the inspiration for House Elves from. So there we go. Here we have Little Red Riding Hood. Again, another one of the stories that I, I like. Mainly because it does tend to get quite dark. You normally have the wolf eating the grandmother and then the, the woodsman chops open the wolf, you know. This wasn't the darkest version of it. But it was still a pretty decent retelling of uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And very much worthy of its position here. Then we have the Three Billy Goats Gruff, and I like this one because I can empathise with the troll who lives under the bridge because he just doesn't want to be disturbed and people keep on disturbing him. But um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just a pretty good fairy tale in general. Other than that, there's not too much to add. It's the Three Billy Goats Gruff, you know, decent story version of it, but nothing too mind-blowing. Then we have the princess and the frog, and the reason I like this one is basically this princess loses her, her golden ball in a pool of water. And this frog says he'll go and get it if he promises to like take her with him, uh, take him with her, like let her sleep on a pillow, let her eat, let him eat from her plate. And she promises him this, and then just runs away. And the uh, frog follows him home. And then her dad, the prince, is like, "No, you promised him. You have to keep your promise." And eventually, she does keep her promise, and the frog turns into a prince. Yeah, so the ending's a bit lackluster, but I like that that the the, the, the king made her keep her promise. You know. Then we have Beauty and the Beast, La Bella La Bette. This is, again, just one of those classic fairy tales. I've always, you know, enjoyed it, you know, enough. This is a pretty decent version of it as well. Three, two, one, go. <clears throat> yeah, I just think that a longer version of it can work a lot better, and um, that's why it wasn't my all-time favourite of all of these. Uh, next up we have Cinderella. I never really thought that Cinderella would be one of my top ones, but uh, I just really like the way this was written, and obviously I'm already familiar with the story that helps. And I had an interesting conversation about what would have happened if she would have been inside the pumpkin when it turned, well, inside the carriage when it turned back into a pumpkin. Would she have just got covered in pumpkin or would she have been like, you know, squished down? I imagine the former. Then we have Hansel and Gretel. What I like about this is this is almost two different stories because we start with the, the father with the wicked wife basically who's trying to get rid of her stepchildren by getting them lost in the forest and then they end up at the witch's house who tries to eat them so I think it's value for money it's like two stories in one you know and uh, yeah always a good story lots of twists and turns in it and it's just an all-time favorite you know 
But out of this, my favourite of the lot was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and I think it's just because I like the different scheming ways that the old queen tries to get hold of Snow White, and I also really appreciated that even when she does get her at the end, she gets her to eat an apple that puts her to sleep. The way that she's saved isn't by some dude just kissing her while she's asleep or whatever. Although a prince does basically take her coffin, but with the dwarves' permission, I guess. And then she's in the back of a carriage in her coffin, and then it goes over a bump, and the apple lump comes out of her mouth, and she wakes up. So, I don't know, that's one way to avoid the issue of consent, I guess. But yeah, that's my top one. So there we have it, that's what I thought of the Ladybird Tales box set. Overall I reckon it's somewhere between a 3.5 and a 4 out of 5. Some of the stories are better than others. They're obviously designed at very young children as well, but they are a great way to get them into fairy tales. For me, I thought it was a really good way to get a good overview of them. Uh, overview of them. And actually that's been quite useful for me because I have a client who gets me to work with fairy tales as well. So this has been a bit of homework, you know. But yeah, all round, I enjoyed reading it. So there we have it, that's what I thought of the Ladybird Tales Once Upon a Time Library box set. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments. I guess let me know which of these fairy tales is your favourite. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.